Hey everyone, in today's video we're going to be talking about Vintage Marantz Stereo Receivers. So as we enter the 2020s, we are entering the decade in which all of these will be turning 50 years old. That is, Vintage Marantz Receivers from the 1970s. It's remarkable that these are still relevant today given what's happened to most technology from the 1970s. However, with the resurgence of vinyl and vintage stereo gear becoming cool again, the value of these vintage brands receivers has absolutely skyrocketed in the last 20 years. So, if you're watching this, you might be looking to buy one of these. Today's video is going to help you decide which one of these might be best for you and what to look for when you're buying one. First, let's talk model numbers. The key thing to know about vintage Marantz receivers is that the model number actually means something. The first digit stands for how many channels the receiver has. This one, the 2250B for example, has two channels, a left and a right channel. Some receivers have four channels, they start with a four, but in this video we're only going to be talking about the stereo receivers. The second digit, I'm not exactly sure what it stands for, but I'm sure someone in the comments does. The third and fourth digits stand for how many RMS watts per channel the receiver's power amplifier is capable of producing. Some receivers' models end in a letter B. This could mean anything depending on the model. Some of these B models are just smaller versions of the previous one. Other B versions are completely different beasts entirely. So now that we know what these model numbers mean, I think these can be classified into two different categories. First category is generation, second is how much power they make. First let's talk about how much power they make. These receivers come in different power levels ranging from 15 to 300 watts per channel. How much power you need for your stereo depends on the speaker you are using. To determine what's best for your stereo, I recommend doing some research on your speaker and finding out how many watts per channel the manufacturer recommends your amplifier has for that speaker. Next, let's talk generation. I'm going to put a table of the receivers that I've made at the bottom of the screen here so you can see how many different Marantz receivers are out there and which generation each model belongs to. The easiest way to tell what generation a Marantz receiver is from is to look at the function buttons. The first generation or early 70s Marantz receivers have brushed aluminum where all of these buttons go. The second generation, like this one, has black plastic where all these buttons go. Third generation will have a secondary piece of brushed aluminum where these buttons go. The fourth generation has a silver dial face instead of a black dial face. There's another line in the table called monster receivers. Those are part of the fourth generation, but they use an entirely different chassis because of the massive power amplifier that they are equipped with. These are also the most powerful and most expensive Marantz receivers you can buy from this era. Which generation is the best generation? I don't know. That's up to you to decide. If I were you, I would choose the one you think looks best. So now that we've discussed model numbers and power levels, let's talk about what to look for when buying one of these receivers. You have three choices, really, when it comes to buying these receivers. You have broken, for parts of repair. You have working, in more or less original condition. Or you have restored. There's a different kind of buyer for each one of these. Parts of repair, that's good for somebody who is a technician or knows a technician that can work on these for a pretty reasonable rate. A general working Marantz receiver is good for your average buyer that isn't looking to spend too much money. These don't break too often, and when they do, it's not terribly difficult to fix them most of the time. However, as these turn 50 years old, there's a lot of electrical components in there that are starting to get tired and something may go wrong. Restored is an excellent way to buy a Marantz receiver. However, everyone seems to have a different definition of what restored means in their opinion. I'll make a video on what my definition of restored is later. But my recommendation to somebody buying a restored Marantz receiver is to be sure you are buying it from a reputable seller that has experience restoring these receivers and has pictures of the circuit boards inside the receiver with new components proving that it has been restored and if they have pictures of them setting the bias and DC offset with a multimeter that's even better you know they're being honest that way 
If you're buying one of these on eBay, obviously you can't listen to it before you buy it. So all you can look for is stuff like the cosmetic condition of the receiver. Are all the buttons intact? Are there a lot of scratches? Scratches might affect your resale value. If the cover is off and you can see inside, do the components look original? Is there any corrosion? Is there a lot of dust? These are all things to consider when buying one of these. But if you're buying somewhere like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, you may have the opportunity to listen to this in person. So without further ado, I'm going to switch to the zoom lens and we're going to take a look at this receiver, go through what I would do if I were buying this, and uh, see what's going on with it. Okay, it's time to inspect this Marantz 2250B. First thing we're going to look at is the cosmetic condition. And if we zoom in on the faceplate, we can see that it's a little dusty. There's some scratches around. And uh, some of these scratches aren't going to be able to uh, be taken out or fixed. But all this dust around the faceplate plastic, some of this dirt on these controls, might have some luck getting that out. Another thing I notice when I look at this is... If you look at the top cover, if the camera decides to zoom, there we go, you can see some corrosion. So that tells me that this receiver has probably been in a garage or a very humid environment for some time in its life, and that could be concerning. So we're going to want to take extra care when we uh, check the controls for uh, proper function and see if they're scratchy or not. So I have the receiver plugged in, I have some speakers hooked up, and I've got my phone hooked up so we can try uh, some source audio. So let's start by turning it on. We'll wait for a click. There it is. So that click is very good. That was the speaker protection relay. And if that clicks on, it means that the receiver is at least kind of healthy. We don't know everything. One thing I do notice is that we have burnt out bulbs. These meters are supposed to be lit up. There's five lamps total that light up this dial face. One of them is burnt out right there. If we check our function indicators, we see tape two, Tape 1, aux, phono, FM, and AM work. FM is supposed to light up this dial pointer, and that's not lighting up, so we know that that light bulb is burnt out too. The Dolby light works, but the stereo light does not work. Focus. There we go. Stereo indicator reading out is a very common thing on these receivers. I will try turning on the speakers. We'll see if we get any static or humming. Pretty quiet and I will start the music and I'll turn up the volume and I'll see what happens there is nothing so that's not good you know why we're not getting sound I didn't switch it back to aux so let's switch it back to aux and maybe we'll get sound now okay we have sound coming from each speaker and it sounds good it doesn't sound distorted or anything I don't hear I don't hear any scratchiness in the volume control. I hear a little bit of static in the treble control. I hear it in the mid control also. And it's also present in the bass control. So that tells me these switches are dirty and they will need to be cleaned. But the fact that we get sound at all is good because oftentimes this switch right here, the tape monitor switch can become dirty and actually keep the uh, sound from reaching the speakers entirely. I don't hear any static from any of the other switches, so that to me is a very good thing. So looking at this, I'm pretty happy with this purchase because it's got all of the uh, knobs. It's got an intact faceplate without any terrible scratches or dents in it. And inside it looks pretty original, which means for me, as a technician, I don't have too much to worry about in terms of navigating other people's work from the past. So, I would only buy this one if you intend to fix it yourself, or you know somebody who can fix it for you. So, in conclusion, if somebody were to buy this receiver, I would advise that they only buy it if they know how to fix it. And that's exactly why I've bought this one. Actually, I got it for free, but don't tell anyone. I'm going to make a series of videos on this receiver and share everything I've learned over the years about fixing these and making them look their best. So, with that, thank you so much for watching. I hope you subscribe so you get the next videos, and I hope you like them. Thanks.
Today's video is going to help you decide which one's right for you, and yeah. Today's video